Hi, everybody, and welcome to AdAge Remotely. I'm Judy Pollack, Executive Editor at AdAge. My guest today is Mo Said, founder of Mojo Supermarket, a small agency that has been making quite a name for itself. Mojo burst out of the gate with some attention-getting campaigns that give new meaning to, this, to the word disruptive. Mo Shaga's shop has hacked the Oscars, declared baseball dead for a client that makes baseball equipment, and censored its own campaign for Savage as F. X Fenty. It also thumbed its nose at the ad business with a direct response style spot that shows ad executives flushing their marketing dollars down the toilet. The ad world has been noticing. Mojo has made the ad age a list to watch roster two years running and has recently picked up some big name clients, including match.com and the truth initiative. I'm chatting with Mo today in advance of our small agency conference coming up August two to four, where he, he will be one of our panelists. Thanks for joining us today, Mo. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. I just want to remind everybody listening today that you can ask questions of Mo and we'll try to get them in today. Okay, so I mentioned right at the top that your work is disruptive in an industry where everything is very disruptive. Can you tell me a little bit about your advertising philosophy? Yeah, I don't know if we make stuff to be disruptive. Uh, it's, it's automatically disruptive when everything, like, advertising is such an annoyance, right? It just shows up when I'm watching my Hulu show and it just shows up. And mm -hmm. at best, even if I really think it's funny, it's a good annoyance. And what we try to do is like, try to like connect with someone culturally, like imagine the best annoyance you've ever heard or the thing that your friend tells you about and say, hey, Judy, you got to check this thing out. And you Google it and you watch it and you become a part of it and you buy T-shirts for it. So that's the kind of work we're doing. We're trying to build brands that are meaningful. Um, so I don't know if it's d disruptive. It's just like people just relate to it and want to be a part of it. Yeah, I actually think, though, there's a little bit of a rebellious streak in some of it. I don't know. It's so different. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about your background. And I have a feeling that has to do with a little bit about how you were raised and how that shaped your idea of creativity and, and advertising. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in Pakistan, right? Like the it's uh, I grew up in Pakistan post 9-11. There was uh, there's two people trying to have a war and I just grew up in the middle of it and creativity was canceled. There's you couldn't go to a music show or like a or like a play or go to the movies or anything. All that stuff was canceled and all you saw was the news and the news was usually bad news. So you kind of got sick of it and you're in this world and to kind of stand out, you you had to do something, something like you had to be meaningful and say something and do something crazy. Um, and I just kind of imagined, you know, creativity lets you imagine a, a life outside of the life that you have. And I just imagined that and I try to create that for myself. Um, and I think I also, I also gained a, an affinity for what was going on in the world and how the news affected, like what you know about Pakistan or the place that I grew up in 10 years ago is just because of the news that you watched. So I grew like I, I, I became very aware of how the news or culture shapes how we think about uh, about anything. So if you Google, if I when I came to the U.S. and I showed my friends where I was from and I Googled Pakistan, it was just camels and sand, and I've never seen a camel or sand. And mm. so you know, I, I got really aware of like how we shape things culturally matters and how on how we think about something. So I think that became. Uh, you know, ads and and stuff weren't as interesting to me, but like changing culture and how we think about stuff was really interesting to me all of a sudden. Well, so how did you get from a young man in Pakistan to now owning your own agency in New York? I, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I started an agency there and I wanted more. So I came to New York and uh, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was. I like flew here and I was like, I'm gonna get, I couldn't get apartments. I couldn't get an apartment in New York. I couldn't get a job in New York because of my name. This is also, mind you, a little bit ago when, when you know, now diversity is just a word we, we have. Um, and I couldn't get a job and I, you know, at, at these big agencies would just point me towards like uh, the Arabic tr translation department. I don't speak Arabic and I'd just be, you know, get pointed at these places. Um, I have a skin disease. I have a skin condition where it makes my skin very, very light. 
uh, kind of the same thing as Michael Jackson has, I guess. Um, and then I faked an accent. And I was like, if there's the only way I can be a copywriter is for me to be an American, then watched a bunch of movies, I faked an accent, and here I am. I pretended to know about a lot of the things that I don't know about. And you actually changed your name, right? I changed my name. My name is Mo now. It wasn't previously Mo ever. That must have been, I mean, just to actually have to change that much just to get a job in this business, and especially with what's going on with diversity and inclusion. And everybody's talking about it, right? It's such a hot thing in the industry. But you experienced some of this discrimination yourself. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, the advertising business is, by the way, the worst business when it comes to diversity of thought, right? Um, we have these, think of, I would say even two years ago, but even now, think of a creative director. What, is, what does he look like? Where is he from? And I say he very intentionally. He's always a he. He's always from Connecticut or Chicago. He always went to school from writing or film, right? So uh, why is a creative director always a writer, always a man from Connecticut? Connecticut's not a hotbed of creativity. It's just a hotbed of people who know people in advertising. So, you know, I think, and then those people try to hire more of themselves, right? So you, then a copywriter just becomes, hey, do we have a man, American man from Connecticut or Chicago who went to film school or writing school or, or, or like a liberal arts school? So you, st you start to hire for these boxes. You've created these boxes and you try to hire for them. What that doesn't take into account is like, I had to then fit into that box to succeed. So. The, what the changes that you're seeing in me, I started watching football and got rid of my Persian friends and I changed my name and changed my accent and what I do and what I hang out or like what I what I care about was I was trying to fit, fit in that box. But what what ha what happens is you're only getting 10 percent of me because I'm filtering 10 percent. I'm filtering myself through this lens that you're able to to handle. Right. So you're only getting 10 percent of my creativity. And that's what's different about Mojo is like. I get people and try to just the the smartest people and trying to build the agency around them and the, build the box around them instead of just like, we have a position for an advertising designer and you need to fit this box. Right. Well, I've been hearing more about people saying, I don't care about for portfolio schools so much anymore. I'm looking for people. Some people have no experience in advertising whatsoever. I mean, do you agree with that? Do you, is, what, what is your hiring philosophy? I didn't go to portfolio school. I think, you know, I, my mind, some people have changed my mind. I think some people need it and some people don't. Um, but it's hard, right? Like I graduated from college and, and I came here and I wanted to work in advertising and they're like, you need to go to portfolio school. And I was like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's going to take two years and you're going to cost a hundred thousand dollars and you have to live in a, in a coastal city that costs a lot of money. And I'm like, shit, I don't have any of those things. So I actually had, I had $1,000 left in my bank account. I spent $900 on a camera. Uh, I went to Best Buy, I bought a camera, and then I was like, okay, if a portfolio is all I need, I went around shooting fake ads and then used that as a portfolio to get an internship. So I think if you're smart, you're smart. I don't think, uh, I, you know, to hiring too many people from the same school means you think the same as well. So I think my hiring philosophy is like, if, if you're smart, you're smart. And if you're smart and a nice person, which is, there's a lot of egos in this industry too. So you're weeding out. If I say, if you're talented and you're a nice person, I've weeded out 98% of this industry. So mm -hmm. with those claims, I will take those 2% no matter where you're coming from. So where did you end up with your first job here in the States then? I worked at a multicultural agency called Global Hue. There used to be these things called oh, yeah. multicultural agencies uh, yeah. that just catered to Hispanic and black people. And I got a job there. And then I worked at BBDO. I interned at BBDO after that. And I, uh, I was just lucky. I, you know, I, I was just really lucky, and I found some good people and learned a lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of things. I was struck by what you said. Used to be multicultural agencies. I mean, there still are agencies yeah. that call themselves multicultural. Do you think that's sort of an antiquated notion now? Or? It's just a cop out for us to not care, right? It's a cop out for me to be, like. It's, it's, it's the same thing as digital agencies. It's the same thing as like any type of agencies, right? Like it's a way for a client or a brand to be able to say, I'm, I've checked this box. I am talking, I'm officially talking to black people now because I have hired an agency that says they talk to black, you know, it's just like, 
just make stuff that that people can relate to. And I sure there is stuff that certain markets need to relate to more, but it's a cop out for me to not want to hire anyone at the agency and ha- hire diverse talent at the agency that can speak to different people. I, I think I think multicultural agency is like a, a kid, right now a kid who grew up on the internet in Malaysia is more similar to a kid who grew up on the internet in New York. And I think it's just a different world. Like we're growing, there's, these kids are growing up on the internet instead of like, oh, you grew up Hispanic, so you must be so different. Well, while we're on the topic of multiculturalism, actually, I'd like to ask you about your work for the Muslim identity jacket. I think we have it to show. Yeah, you know, I do a lot of uh, personal side projects, I guess. And this was just, a, you know, I think now I have the the luxury of speaking through my work and with brands, right? So I, I'm making this thing that uh, I'm talking about um, dating through our, our match uh, client. But this was something just I, ne- I needed to say at that time. And this was, um, again, not trying to get political. I'm actually not a very political person, but the when the, 26, 20, the first Donald Trump election was happening, he was saying a lot of wild stuff that Muslims should wear identity jackets at all times. Um, and, you know, and I wanted to show people what what that ends up being when that becomes culture. I grew up in a culture where where whatever you said on TV molded the way you the people thought. So I wanted people to know like what that would look like. So we made signs that looked exactly like New York parking signs or whatever and um, showed basically like if this if this actually if this guy gets into office and he actually does the things he's saying, looks like a very scary world. So I, 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 put, I made this installation around New York City. I was uh, wanted by the NYPD for a little bit. You were? Yeah. I, I think it's too late for them to get me now, but I was. Okay. Well, they know where you are right this minute. But this is the first time I've publicly admitted that that was me. <laughs> I have some shout outs. We have people watching uh, Khalid, Nadine, Jennifer, Tasha, and Z2. Um, and also, if you have questions, guys, just please let us know, and we'll try to get them to Mo. OK, so we, we, you got your first internship here. I know that you also worked at Droga for a while. And yeah. I've been noticing that a lot of our small agencies are people who, at one point or another, pass through Droga's doors. <clears throat> and I'm kind of curious, curious about what that taught you or how that shaped you as a creative. I mean, it's. It- you become a creative and then you try to work at the most creative company that you can find, right? And Droga5 was, was that for a long time. Droga5, you know, I was having a conversation with an ex-Droga5 person earlier and she said, there, you know, a lot of agencies, I know that their work is their work because it's like, oh, this agency makes expensive work or this agency makes funny work. Droga5's work was good work and I think that's why a lot of us went there. Um, my experience was you know, there's good and there's bad. And I think the really good was like, my creative was David Droga. My creative director was David Droga. How cool is that? It's a, he's a really smart person. I'm friends to him with him today. Um, I think the experience was, there was a lot of smart people there and a lot of people to learn from. And I think that, so when you see a lot of people coming out of there that are, that are successful now, I think there was just a scary amount of really smart people there then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he spoke at our conference a couple of years ago. It was really popular. So he's very, very smart. So you decided to <clears throat> you open your own agency. What made you do that? There's a couple reasons, Judy. I think uh, there's a reason because of the work, and there's a reason because of personally. So they're both very personal. But the work was like, I think I was making the work that I didn't want to be making. You know, I I made a Super Bowl commercial and then had all these people come over to watch the Super Bowl at my house. And then I went to the bathroom during that Super Bowl commercial because I didn't want to watch it again. And, you know, I think you, you I, in that bathroom, I was like, what am I doing? I like came here to, I, I, I mean, you know, I turned, I turned my back on like everything, everyone I knew. I moved here, I changed everything to be able to make this work. And if it's not the work that I want to be making, that I need to, need to do something about that. Um, I wanted to be making more of the work that we're making now. And I don't think any one is good versus bad. I think I just wanted to be making work that like culturally connects with someone on a different level that like people that want to be a, become a part of like these little movements that we create that people want to be a part of. Um, 
So that's the work thing. I, I really wanted to make the work that I wanted. And also, let's like I think agencies. This is no no knock on Droga Five or or any agency that I've been at. I think agencies, the advertising industry generally, I had a ceiling there, right? I've been fired off of a client after doing great work because of my name and where I'm from. I I have a jacket that has a Pakistani flag that I take off every time I go into a meeting. I had a ceiling there. What was I going to do eventually? Run New York Times? I don't. I don't like. There's a ceiling for me in the industry. I was, you know, I realized all these things. I realized that I had, had changed a lot of myself and I was only letting through a little bit of myself and my work and all these things. So I wanted to explore what happens when I, when 100% of me comes out to play and, and I wanted to find a place where old me and new me, could, like I could find what, who I am now and, um, and, and build a home for other creatives that were like this. A lot of our creatives are disenfranchised people from the industry like people who had quit, people who had gotten let go because they just didn't fit in to, to, to the industry. So I wanted to create, you know, I came here with the dream of working at the greatest home and school for creatives. So I actually left to make a school that Mojo Supermarket was supposed to be a school. It still is a school that's just masquerading as an agency. It, I wanted to create the greatest creative school where people can come from all sorts of backgrounds and like push each other and become really great creatives and make the best work of their lives. Um, started off as a school and I think we masqueraded really well to be as a business right now. Well, I think you gave me a pretty great segue with the story about the bathroom, the Super Bowl. Um, so I'd like to show the money toilet commercial now if we could. Are you sick of wasting money making bad commercials for the big games? What if I told you there's an easier, faster way for you to waste your cash? Introducing Money Toilet. Tell me more. Why work with a big ad agency when you can cut out the middleman and put money directly into the Money Toilet? Sounds smart if you ask me. I'm a businessman. No social posts. No media plan. Just a waste of money. Looks like I'm getting promoted. This toilet is a real product. So don't wait. Get your Money Toilet at the website below. You should buy it. Is it a way, the easier way, moneytoilet.com. Okay, so did you have any concerns go. about biting the hand that fed you there? It's not the hand that feeds me. Okay. It's, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, I, I actually didn't even think about that till we almost aired it. A lot of people are like, are you afraid that you're turning away clients? And I'm like, we're, I think we're turning away the right clients. Because if you want to, if you want to spend like $2 million making a commercial and then $5 million by paying someone to watch it. And if it's still really bad, then it's probably not our, not our, the right client for us. I'm not against Super Bowl commercials, by the way. I watched the Eminem Super Bowl commercial in Detroit and uh, everyone cried around me and that changed that brand. So I'm not saying Super Bowl commercials are bad. I'm saying most of them are bad and most of them are a waste of money. Um, I think I wanted to say this thing that was like, most Super Bowl commercials are bad, and we get so caught up in in our in our life and be like, okay, well, we're spending seven million dollars. It's going to make seven million dollars worth of worth of noise or not? Because if you just want to make noise, just like I I would rather drive a plane over New York just throwing out seven million dollars, and I think more people will get attention that way. Then like nobody remembers these terrible commercials. I honestly think some of the commercials during the Super Bowl are the worst commercials I've ever seen because so many people have had their fingers in them. And you can see, you know, how it evolved from what might have been a good idea to where it is where it doesn't make any absolute sense. Did you um, get a good reaction to that? Ed? Did you get clients from it or calls? I the money toilet? I don't actually know that. It, it was more so we didn't, you know, I think a lot of we didn't really do it for that. We just aired it. I think we got more reaction from creatives mm -hmm. in the industry. Yeah. I think I got like hundreds of creatives writing like, this is what I've been trying to say. And all these things are really bad. And, and I think it was more of a frustration from, I was surprised. I think more, I thought more clients would, would talk about it. But more creatives were like, yeah, we're making these terrible things and I don't want to be making these anymore. Well, let's talk about some of the good things you've been making. Um, I want to talk about give her a break. Uh, if I if I have this wrong, correct me. But as I understood, it was it was in protest for women directors not being named at the Oscars, and you took the the stream and replaced the commercials with snippets of commercials from female directors. Um, yeah. Is that right? And if so, like how did you come up with the idea? What generated this? Um, you know, this is our industry. We have to take 
the money toilet, this thing, like this is our industry. The creative industry is our industry. So we have to kind of take responsibility for it. I think there's a lot of people that just like complain about it, but don't take responsibility for it. So mm -hmm. first of all, when I heard this stat and we talked to my cousin's a director, she's been in this industry, all those me too guys that you see canceled now, she's dealt with all of them in her career. And I was having lunch with her and she, we were talking about how crazy the stat is. And then I went to the agency and we were like, let's do something about this. We should do something about this. And we didn't want to make a commercial that pointed out the problem. We were just done talking about it. I think we complained. So we were just done complaining about it. So we were like, these films deserve to be in the Oscars and we're just going to put them there. We have to find a way to put these films in the Oscars. And the first question is obviously, well, we don't own the Oscars and we don't have that much money or power. So, you know, we found a creative way. I think ideas and that people, you know, I think the biggest thing with this was like people have power. People these days have power and ideas have power. So we wanted to say something about this and say these these films are amazing and they belong in the Oscars and we're going to put them there. So we decided to hack the Oscars. Sounds irresponsible, irresponsible if you ask our lawyer, but it's something that we wanted to take responsibility for and not just like talk about anymore. Well, we've already ascertained the police are looking for you, so. Um, so I, then let's move on to Fenty, okay? Um, yeah. I think we have a little piece of that too. Uh, this is a really different way of treating things. I mean, you um, actually censored your own ad. So how did that come about too? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? Like we're trying to say something. A lot of brands are like, you know, I think the Fenty client, the Savage Fenty clients are great and there's a great brand and a lot of brands that get caught up in that world say just like, oh, it's a fashion show and Rihanna's in it. Let's just say that. And you're like, wait, but what does the brand mean to people? And they're like, it's a brand by Rihanna. And you're like, no, what does a brand mean to people? And I think if you dig in, the brand means that like there's been there's just been one gaze where like sexuality for women has been looked at. And this brand allows other people, women with women and men with different, you know, sexual orientations, different body types, different skin tones to finally feel like they have a brand for them. So we wanted we wanted to talk about that. We wanted to say, OK, this is what the brand means. So we dug into this insight that most women that post lingerie photos of themselves get censored if they're like if they're uh, plus size or if they're different ethnicities, because on, on Instagram, anyone can just report, not for any reason, but just, like the reason could just be they're, they're a bigot and they could just report something and then it gets censored. And just because they're not skinny and white and German, it gets censored. So we wanted to talk about that. We want to talk about like, well, if, if you're, if, you know, if these lingerie photos are too sensitive for you, then our show is probably very sensitive to you. You know, our sense, our show is very sensitive to sensitive people. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to say that by pointing out the, in the way that things get censored. So we just, we knew this campaign was going to get censored. So we were like, let's just censor it first and make a statement out of it. This content is too savage or too spicy or whatever to, for you to handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all, well, there's, again, the a disruptive con uh, concept comes to me because we're talking about both these campaigns and then we're not, uh, you also did some work for Girls Who Code, which was quite different. But these are all like really strong social issues, right? Discrimination against female directors, um, body shaming and attitude towards girls in STEM careers. Um, but they also did draw attention to your agency, right? To what extent was this kind of a way to also get public relations for your shop? It wasn't, it ended up being that, but it was, I think you just do good work, right? You do good work and then good work follows. I, we've never had a new business person. We've made work. And then, you know, everyone who's starting an agency these days and talks to me and says like, how do I get clients or whatever? Just like, just do good work. Whatever assignment you're getting, if you're making, if you're painting a restaurant sign, just do really good work. And I promise you that the good work will follow. Um, none of it was initially like, oh, this is gonna get attention for the agency. It was always, you know, we try to solve a problem with clients. We, a lot of our, a lot of our clients have come because of the work and a lot of our clients actually have come more, more of our clients have become come because of referrals. We're like the client that is working with us on this project uh, will refer us. It's, it's just like, you know, I think a lot of this stuff happened where, during COVID, right? And I think 
during COVID is when marketers realized that their agencies or their work just wasn't that good or wasn't that effective because I think all the sheen got taken off of it. The production sheen and the fast talking suits in the in the agencies and the big boardrooms. And I think when you took that away, people just looked at the work and they looked at the work and they're like, shit, this doesn't really do anything for us. And this isn't like relate. No one's relating to any of these things. Yeah. Um, so when that happened, I think people looked for work that that was resonating with groups of people. And then they found the Giver a Break and then they found the Savage and then they found Girls Who Code and they found the Adidas. And mm -hmm. that's how we get to do that work. Um, I think the attention was a byproduct that we didn't really account for attention on us. We accounted for just like more people involved in the cause or issue or product that we were talking about. It's okay. really fortunate that every, every, we're really fortunate that way that every single thing we've made has gotten press. But I think it wasn't to make press. It was just, you know, we just decided to do the work that was right for that thing at that time. Right. And it did lead to new business because you actually, you brought in Match not, not long ago in the Truth Initiative. So yep. you're a pretty small shop and these are big accounts. Like, and this is something we're going to be discussing at the small agency conference, which everyone watching should attend. Um, but do you worry at all about this changing kind of the culture of your shop with these major accounts? They're not major to us. Uh, they're major to every account is major to us, but like, we're not going to grow, you know, the, we are turning a lot of business down right now. And that's just because it's not, it's not the thing that we need to say, or it's not the thing that we need to work on, or it's not the right people for us. And the culture will change if we try to grow. Absolutely. But the goal of this was never to grow. Like I didn't start this and saying, let's, let's see how, let's see how big we can get. Um, I, I think a lot of that comes from like people trying to make a really cool business. I grew up in a, in a household that we couldn't even afford the AC, right? Like well, we didn't have electricity every other hour. And now I have a machine that washes my dishes. It's amazing. This thing just does the dishes. So, you know, I don't have like a financial ambition out of this and be like, well, we need to grow as fast as we can. Um, I want to make the best work there is out there. So I don't think it'll change. It'll change if we let it change. But I think the culture is really fun and you no, know, there's no, it's very collaborative and fun. And there's really, really smart people here. And I think that won't change because I don't want to work there. I had, a, I've had jobs where I don't want to work and I hope, hopefully this is my last. Um, we did, we talked about so many serious spots. I know we're running out of time, but I would like to show a little bit of um, a much funnier spot you did for Adidas, if we have it. Here's Atis Jr. has been getting games started off with a bang here for the Padres. Uh, okay, here we go again. This Tatis fella, I don't like him. Three and oh, and the guy is swinging. People will say that's bad etiquette, but the game's What happened to respect? There are unwritten rules. But there's still rules. Mm -hmm. Look at this guy's hair. He's blonde. Guy looks like a Christmas tree or something. Look at him flip the bat again. Flipping the bat? Go flip some burgers, man. You go flip a bat. When I play, next time up, you're going to get a ball in your ear hole. Who do they think he is? He's a punk. He's a hot dog. Listen to your coach. Listen to your manager. I tell you, watching this guy makes me want to play again. You were never all that good, though, really. God, this TV sucks. So you have 30 seconds to tell me how you sold Adidas on that. I think it's the same thing, right? Like, Adidas, why does baseball matter to Adidas? Why, is Adidas do, why does Adidas have anything to say about baseball? And what does Adidas have to say about baseball? I think a lot of times... We go and like, let's just show this player hitting home run after home run. We've got this player. That one barely shows the player, which is a very big risk for Adidas, right? Mm -hmm. But they're trying to say something about baseball. They're trying to say, damn, this sport, sport sucks now because of how we, it hasn't changed and it needs to change. And they're all about changing sport for the better. And we decided we had something to say. And I think everything that we try to do is like has to have something to say or has to have a point of view. It has to change, you know, the savage, all those things. It has to change how I think about something, myself, the world, baseball, whatever, uh, female creatives. Um, and we wanted to work with them on like, what are we trying to say? What are we trying to change? And they're great, they're amazing clients that we worked with. That I, you know, I think we worked, we worked on like, 
what is what is the fact that we're trying to change? We're trying to change baseball because it's it's kind of like a little stuck in its ways. And there's these players like Fernando Tatis that get that get just shit on for for being innovative and flashy and all these things. And, and Dominican half of it is racism, right? And we wanted to say that like we support as a brand support the future of baseball and and players like him that are going to change baseball. And we don't like we don't care for the way baseball is because it needs to change and we love and it is for real people who love the sport and I got a lot of emails saying you must really love the sport to make this and I'm actually not a big baseball fan but I'm glad because we get we really dig into these insights and try to find something that will relate to the people and the people will care about and is culturally relevant to them um, I'm not I don't buy lingerie I don't watch baseball I am not a teenager getting into STEM and all these things aren't for me. And I think a lot of the ego and the and the point of view of the person running the agency shows and a lot of the work we do. And this isn't for me. It has to work for the people uh, who are the audience and they have to care about it passionately. And I think that's what we try to do. So we try to there's the same formula for Adidas. What do, what do people want to say about what do we want to say about baseball as a brand? I'll tell you, you gave us a lot to think about today. Thank you so much, Mo, for joining us. I really Thank enjoyed this. Thank you for this. having me. No, um, absolutely. Uh, that is all the time we have for today. Um, if you want to hear more from Mo, sign up for a small agency conference and awards where he will be one of a number of great panelists on August 2 to 4. Get your tickets at adage.com slash SACA2021. Thank you, everybody, and good day. <laughs>